Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this webinar from Spatial Digital Twins to the Metaverse. My name is Barbara Ryan, and I'm just uh, delighted that you're joining us today. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Connect Me for organizing this, and of course, all the panelists that you're going to hear from. I'm really excited about uh, these talks that are coming up and the panel discussion that will be following. Um, I've got a couple slides to show uh, just to set the context a little bit and tell you a little bit about WGIC. But while I'm doing that, uh, we've put a poll together for uh, the audience to just give us a little insight into the demographics of the audience. So if you could take a look at the poll that's there, it'll talk about what sector you're in and then geographically where you're from. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show the slides on WGIC while you're answering that poll, and then we'll take a look at uh, we'll take a look at that uh, the results of the poll before we get started. Um, and what I want to do is um, say that we WGIC are a not for profit trade association. Um, but you have to be a private sector company to join. And we're just delighted that you're going to hear from uh, several of our members this afternoon. We've got um, really just a couple, I think, really simple strategic objectives. Clearly, we want to strengthen the contributions of this entire sector, geospatial and earth observations to society and the global economy the global economy. We undertake a number of policy studies and soon, and as a lead up to this um, this event, we'll be releasing a report on the metaverse. And then, of course, as a trade association, we want to create business opportunities for the geospatial uh, industry writ large. In the lead up to this event, we had actually um, issued back at the end of uh, 2022 a spatial digital twins report. And so for this webinar, moving from spatial digital twins to the metaverse, this is a good, um, kind of a good lead up. So there's a QR code if you're interested in downloading that report and our metaverse report will foul, will foul this. So a lot of groundwork was in this report. Of course, we're going to do some deeper dives from our member companies today, and then the foul up metaverse report will foul this event. Um, I guess when we talk about geospatial and everything and geospatial for everyone, this slide is really quite meaningful for me. It actually is the launch of our new logo, and you'll see that up at the top uh, of the slide, because I think you probably all know there are digital twins in the atmosphere, in the biosphere, in the hydrosphere, in the geosphere, and clearly in the human, human sphere. You're going to see examples from these today. And yet when we make the uh, move from these individual domain-based spatial digital twins, what we're going to propose in the report that's going to be launched for the metaverse is that we as a community need to do a better job of linking these spatial digital twins in each of the domains that you see on that slide in the sum total of those linked digital twins could ultimately start to build out the virtual universe that we live in. Let's call it the metaverse. So anyway, that's gonna be uh, some context for our discussions and hopefully debates later on in this, uh, in this presentation. I mean, in this panel discussion that you're going to hear from. Um, our member companies are shown here. 45 member companies are comprised the World Geospatial Industry Council. And you're going to hear from four of them today. So you'll hear first from Pooja Mahapatra from Fugro. And Pooja, Pooja is the global lead for uh, all of geospatial at Fugro. She will then hand the platform over to Simon Musius from Hexagon, and Simon's the VP for Business Development at Hexagon. Simon will turn the podium over to Greg 
Demchak from Bentley and Greg Leeds is a senior um, director for digital innovation at Bentley. And then last but not least, Greg will turn it over to Peter Atala from Vex Voxel Maps. And Peter is the CEO and founder of Voxel Maps. But before we hear from each of those individual member companies, then what I would like to do is actually give the uh, uh, prime time to Dr. Victor Ku, who is the director of surveying and geospatial at the Singapore Land Authority. They've done some remarkable work there. And so what we'd like to do is set this entire um, program up with a government perspective coming from Victor, and then we'll do some deeper dives into each of the WGIC member companies on what they are doing somewhere in the Earth's domain on spatial digital twins to ultimately build out the metaverse. So I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. And Victor, I'd like to, uh, oh, sorry, Dr. Ku, Let, let's just, uh, can everybody see the, um, can see the results of the uh, demographic poll, Anne? Yes, they can. Okay, good. So city municipal governments and GIS geospatial mapping look like they uh, lead uh, the pack there. Um, state government about 20%, federal government about 4%, public works at seven, and then transportation at about uh, 13%. Thanks. Uh, how about geographically, And Do we have that? Just scroll down a little bit on your screen. Oh boy, and I just closed the screen, so I lost uh, Basically, it. we have 15% uh, from the USA West, uh, sorry, 21%, 30% from USA Central Mountain Area, 25% from USA East, 7% from US South, 11% uh, from Canada, 11% uh, from Europe, 1% from Asia, 4% from South America, and 1% from Africa. Okay. All right. So heavily uh, biased towards the U.S. Um, um, but Dr. Ku, let's turn it over to you. And I just want to personally thank you because I know how late it is for uh, you in Singapore, and it's great that uh, you're willing to join us. Over to you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, for the introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is um, Victor Ku. I just want to check that you have you are able to see my slides now. Yes, we are. They look great. Thank you. Thank you. So um, my name is Victor Ku. I lead the um, Survey and Geomatics Division in the Singapore Land Authority. So to give you a context, uh, I'm going to talk about Singapore. Uh, SG is a code for Singapore, so SG Digital Twin. Um, just uh, be before I start, um, Singapore uh, is a very small uh, country. We are a city as well as a country uh, in, in the same space. Uh, we are just about 720 square kilometer in land size, uh, including the sea space. We are about uh, 1,400 uh, square kilometer. So uh, the place I'm working in, the Singapore Land Authority, um, we are the uh, National Mapping and Geospatial Agency. Uh, one of our key um, role is in uh, creation of geospatial information, promotion of geospatial information uh, to support the uh, whole of government's uh, activity. So that's where I'm coming from. And today I'm going to share with you um, the initiative that we are working on, uh, which is a journey for us uh, uh, that we have started uh, way back in 2013. So we are going to talk about, you know, from Digital Twin to Metaverse. I'm going to start with Digital Twin. I think this is um, um, a, 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 the definition that may not be very clear to everyone. Uh, and of course, digital twin is not new. Um, you see it in manufacturing, in automotive, and in other sector. But today, we are focusing on the digital twin of city. Uh, basically, it's a, of larger area, uh, more complex than um, automotive and other uh, sector. Um, and uh, 
the motivation you know in singapore as an urban nice city uh, why are we uh, focusing on uh, digital twin so we believe that the city of tomorrow uh, will be powered by digital twin so digital twin is a very important uh, component um, for us uh, in these three areas uh, to build a safe sustainable and smart singapore and uh, when i say that it means that uh, we are trying to uh, solve the issue of urban planning green energy urban heat uh, climate change and as well as uh, being smart you know going to digital construction uh, intelligent transportation systems and autom autonomous mobility um so in our case uh we would like to call that SG Digital Twin, uh, which we identified that there are three core components. Uh, the first one is what we call the 3D semantic based city model. So we need the 3D city models as a base uh, for the Digital Twin. Uh, on top of that, we need a program you know, to update, to keep the Digital Twin up to date. Uh, that's a 3D national mapping program. Uh, I will go uh, more in depth into uh, the item number two and item number one. But beyond all this, you need to have a very good uh, 3D data management framework you know, to manage all the data uh, that, that comes together. So um, we also have this framework. We believe that you, know, you need to go through capture, model, manage, and deliver. Um, capture the very fundamental data model them into 3D, uh, into different products as well, not just 3D, but 2D as well. Uh, we have to have a pro good uh, program to manage the data over time and have people who are able to deliver uh, specific products, specific digital twins uh, to the different uh, user. Um, in the development of SG Digital Twin, uh, we have these four development principles. Uh, we want it to be smart, accurate, reliable, consistent and interoperable um, is, is quite fundamental to us. You know, the model that we create needs to be a smart model. It has to be semantic based model. It has to be accurate. It's based on mapping principle. Uh, it has to be single sort of truth, um, reliable and consistent. Uh, this is the only one for whole government. And of course, uh, inter interoperable. So it has to be based on an open source uh, format and interoperable interoperable. So what it means is that we want to capture once and use by many. Um, and uh, what we really believe is this um, diagram that, you know, 3D mapping is the fundamental, is the basis. This is reality mapping uh, from the real world uh, in order to create 3D city models. And then, of course, uh, with a lot of additional uh, components, we can build a city digital twin. And of course, finally, that is the basis for all uh, work in the metaverse. Um, the program that we had uh, since 2013 uh, is the National 3D Mapping Program. So this is the program for us to capture, model uh, the city models. Uh, we have works uh, on with aerial mapping, airborne, as well as uh, on the ground, uh, on a car, right? So I'm going to show you uh, the next slides that shows that the two uh, major uh, data capturing campaign, uh, the area photogrammetry uh, that covers whole of Singapore, including all the islands, and the two techniques are using is laser scanning, airborne laser scanning, as well as uh, area imagery, uh, which covers both nadir and public imagery. And on the road that covers all the public goods in Singapore is also another uh, mobile systems with air with with uh, 360 imagery as well as uh, laser scanning that covers the whole of Singapore. So these two uh, uh, techniques um, uh, allow us to capture a lot of data, your know, imagery and point clouds, and allow us to create uh, many products, uh, both 2D and 3D, out from this data set. And the most important, one of the most important data set is the building models. Uh, every single building is model. Uh, for the whole city. Uh, and we model it based on the city GML uh, format, uh, which is open, uh, open uh, OGC format that 
contain uh, 3D geometry, the topology, semantics, and appearance uh, for, the, for the building model. And this is the important element uh, for us to use the data set going in the future. And uh, so beyond the uh, vector model, which is the CCM model that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, that is the more intelligent model. We also created the 3D mesh model uh, using uh, the uh, photogrammetry method um, that is on the right-hand side of the screen. So these two models are, have their own uh, usage, have their own cap capability, and we believe that our city models, our digital twin, you know, will come from both uh, city models. And uh, we also have came out with this uh, idea that the SG digital twin will comprise of the different data sets. Uh, a lot of them are 3D data sets and some of them are 2D data sets. And the idea here is really to be able to integrate, to be able to put all these 20 data set together uh, based on the different applications uh, to support all the digital twins uh, um, application and usage. Uh, the architecture that we are looking at is really, there's a source data. Um, the national mapping program gives us the biggest source of data. But on top of that, we have regulatory submission, positioning information, other sorts of data. Put them together, it becomes information into a platform, and that will meet the different needs of the nation uh, for the digital twin. Um, we also believe that the SG Data Twin, which is the city digital model, is the core, and it can it should be in the interface with the different systems uh, that provide them with the data and to build new digital twin along the way. Um, and uh, for the past uh, eight years, uh, you know, with the data, with the digital data, with the digital twin data, we need to work uh, with the different users, the different case uh, use cases. So here are some of the examples. Uh, we are working closely with the planning authority uh, for urban planning. Uh, in the area of solar potential, uh, we can map every single building, every single rooftop of the building, uh, what are the solar potential in the area of supporting drone um, flying in Singapore, in the area of sustainability and resilient uh, for flood risk management, uh, in the area of civil aviation and in the area of greenery management, which is a tree mapping for whole Singapore. So this is just a few examples of the usage of the digital twin, the usage of the product uh, from the 3D national mapping that we have conducted. So moving beyond what we are doing, you know, our models are generally uh, created, uh, especially the city GMR models are created uh, manually, uh, one by one, every single building uh, we created the models. But going in the future, we believe that uh, we should work um, on AI um, and looking at ways that we can improve the producti productivity of the modeling. You know, when we capture the data in a month's time, we need uh, you know, a, a few months uh, to create the models and this is not very productive. And we wanted to be very fast in terms of our updating uh, for the new, new models. And AI is really key uh, for us to move forward. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, today, uh, our models are not as good looking, right? Uh, in terms of the uh, appearance, in terms of the uh, visualization. Uh, what we also believe is that, uh, you know, with the uh, game engine, uh, in this case, it's the Unreal uh, engine, uh, we are able to adopt that technology uh, with the data, with the accurate data, we wanted to go into accurate metaverse, uh, development of accurate metaverse. And, and this could be you know, for a small area in Singapore, as well as for indoor uh, in some of the areas in Singapore. So uh, this is our journey. Um, we have started the journey and we, you know, it's, it's, uh, again, it's a journey. Uh, we need to keep on improving. We need to keep on tapping on the uh, technology that we have today 
uh, understanding where is the direction of technology, be it the uh, capturing technology, the modeling technology, as well as the visualization technology uh, to help us to keep on improving uh, going in the future. So we have not met our objective of digital twin yet. Uh, we are still uh, working on it. Uh, there's still a lot of improvement uh, required. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, end my presentation here. Uh, and I would like to introduce the next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Puja. Uh, from, uh, she's a global lead uh, from the geospatial with Frugo. Uh, I'd like to uh, pass the floor to uh, Dr. Puja. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ku. Those were fascinating examples. And um, I hope to be able to uh, now talk about some of the underlying technology that goes into uh, into uh, the kinds of uh, examples that uh, Dr. Ku shared with us. Um, so a bit of a, uh, an introduction, um, um, or by way of introduction, uh, my name is Pooja. Um, I'm the global lead for geospatial at Fugro. We are by no means a new company. Uh, we've been around for about 60 years. Um, and uh, over this time, we have uh, collected, analyzed, and advised based off geodata over practically every aspect uh, of our planet. Um, so we've steadily understood more and more of our planet through geodata. Um, and this is by using various different platforms at different scales and for different use cases. Uh, we focus on three key market segments, that is uh, energy, infrastructure, and water. And I'll try to give you some examples uh, of this during the course of the next 10 minutes. Um, so um, as, as the example uh, previously showed us, um, we have a lot of information uh, about our planet. Um, many of our end users find that they're very data rich, but yet information poor. Um, so uh, what is the best way to actually manage these gigabytes and terabytes of geodata? The key is to actually convert these points and pixels into actionable information. So um, if I can uh, give you an anal uh, analogy of, of something that uh, we've probably, uh, we, all, we probably all play with or have played with in the past, um, what we start off is, is geodata in this case, data, uh, which by itself doesn't mean very much unless we, we, we process or analyze it in some way. Um, we can explain it with the story, which is why a visualization is very important. Um, and then in the end, what you want to do is derive actionable insights from it. And, and that's where digital twin comes into play. That's where then eventually the metaverse comes into play. So um, if I were to show you how, uh, how we, we conceive this connection between geodata, um, um, you know, um, digital twin all the way to the metaverse, essentially by levering, leveraging the power of geodata, organizations can make informed decisions. Uh, they can optimize operations and they can enhance user experiences. Um, we can deliver significant value today through digital twins while building the engine for the enterprise metaverse of tomorrow, like, like the example that was shown uh, previously. Um, so it all starts with good geodata, um, uh, garbage in, garbage out. I guess that's that's the fair analogy. If you want a good metaverse in the end, you, you have to start with, with the right geodata and good geodata. You'll need to then do some sort of analytics. You'll need to convert that geodata into insights. Um, and that goes into building what's called a digital twin, which is a virtual repli replica of the real world. But um, we probably know, depending on your use case, depending on what sort of a user you are, uh, a digital twin might mean a different thing to you. For instance, if, you're, if you belong to a transportation network, a digital twin might uh, mean a different thing um, as when you're trying to solve uh, something around climate change adaptation for, uh, for a city. Um, so basically, a digital twin is normally built for an individual use case, um, and we try to build it in the most fit for purpose way using the right geodata for the right case. Um, and of course, there's the potential for reuse. And then you go to the fact that you, you, you eventually want to be interconnecting these different kinds of digital twins, especially when we're talking about global problems like climate change, which is obviously a very interconnected problem. You will need to have a network of digital twins. And eventually you get to a, a transformational state where you're in a metaverse, where at an enterprise level, you're really able to give your employees and end users that integrated immersive experience across all of these different use cases to give you really that power of, of combined insights through, through good in integration of data. So that's how we, we, we look at this. And, and, and over the course of the next couple of minutes, I will, I will just show you some examples of geodata, analytics, and digital twin to pave the way towards the metaverse. So um, what we are building at Fugro is essentially a spatial digital twin of the planet. And we're calling it virtual Earth. Virgio, 
virtual geo, Virgio. Um, and uh, these are the various steps that, the, the, as, as the slide will show you, um, it, it, it is, it, we, we are trying to provide essentially survey grade 3D data uh, to any, uh, to, you know, various uh, use cases, whether it's in the city environment or whether it's natural assets. Um, and uh, uh, the key is to map, model, and monitor. And uh, especially in today's changing world, the monitoring part is 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 of increasing importance. Um, you know, uh, with with you know our changing environment. Um, we do this using a variety of different technologies, both uh, remote sensing, uh, but also through uh, sensors that we dig deep into the ground. Uh, we uh, we own a whole fleet of, of vessels that uh, that that we use to collect data offshore in the marine environment. Um, and uh, essentially, we connect all of these different data sets to form this this digital twin um, of the of the Earth. So on land, at sea, and in the coastal zone. Um, we, because we have access to so many different technologies, so many different platforms, uh, we, we, we are able to select the right sensor platform for the right job. Uh, anybody who knows anything about geodata probably knows that there's not a single sensor that takes all the boxes or not a single uh, platform that takes all the boxes. It's always a question of the amount of time that you have or the, or the use case that you have or the cost that you have uh, in our, or the budget that you have, et cetera, et cetera. And what we try to do is advise our clients to, to really make that fit for purpose uh, solution based off the right geodata. And even if you focus on a single technique, uh, for instance, airborne or, or aerial data acquisition, there's a variety of different uh, sensors that can be um, attached to a plane. Um, you can, for instance, or, or, or various ways you can acquire this data. You can acquire LIDAR, you can uh, acquire imagery, either oblique or, 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 or nadir, or a combination of all of it, depending on what your, your constraints for your specific project is. Um, High resolution LiDAR um, is, is obviously the gold standard here uh, when you're talking about elevation and, and precise uh, digital twinning. Um, and it's obviously well suited for a, a range of different uh, activities. Um, and what we try to do is really uh, provide our, 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 our customers, our clients with, with very visually appealing and very accurate survey grade data that can be used for a variety of applications. So as you can imagine, uh, uh, with, with the, also with the AI and, and, and the, the, the cloud-based analytics that, that we are able to, uh, to provide, uh, our clients are able to very, very quickly um, uh, get information about the area of interest before it, 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 it gets obsolete. You know, I mean, if you're acquiring data and it takes you half a year to process it, because this is really, really big data, as you can imagine, this is dense 3D data. Um, yeah, quite often your, your your world looks slightly different then. And uh, so we, we pride ourselves in being able to really provide this data to our clients um, with a very short turnaround time. Um, so yeah, this is an example. Uh, I'd be curious if anybody in the audience actually guesses where this is. Um, but uh, yeah, spoiler alert, it's uh, it's in the south of uh, the United States. Um, obviously, you can do a lot of derived analytics from LiDAR and from imagery. Uh, so in this case, it's, it's it's an example of a digital elevation model that's de derived from LiDAR, useful for flood modeling, storm water management, that sort of application. Um, also imagery is quite often collected uh, together with LiDAR, uh, which uh, provides context and also gives you a historical record of what the conditions actually were when we captured the LiDAR data. Um, and of course, you can do very fancy, um, uh, visually appealing, but also very meaningful, very data rich uh, or information rich uh, analytics to the data to, to really precisely answer your, your question at hand, whether it is calculating biomass volumes or whether it is calculating canopy cover change. Uh, with, with with vegetation and similarly analytics with buildings. So we have a proprietary um, algorithm called Sense.LiDAR. Uh, it's, it's the thing that I talked about earlier where we use AI over very large uh, data sets to very, very accurately classify these dense LiDAR point uh, clouds into features of interest. So you can classify them into bare earth or into buildings or into, into vegetation um, and so on and so forth. Um, and that obviously saves a lot of manual effort when it comes to uh, to cleaning up these big data sets. And then you can take it a step further. You can start modeling objects from from lidar. Uh, so a, a good use case of this is uh, what we uh, what we're doing in the United States together with uh, with our partners, Rapid SOS. Uh, you know, in a time of emergency, um, every second counts. Um, and what we're providing emergency services across the U.S is a very accurate 3D visualization of color, lo color locations within dense, uh, in this case, for instance, within dense urban environments. So suppose someone's calling 911 from the 13th floor of a very tall building, you very, very quickly uh, can send a first responder right to the area or right to, uh, to the correct floor of the correct building um, and, and, uh, yeah, and hopefully save their life. 
Um, something else we do for our clients in the utility sector is provide a full scale uh, digital twin of, the, of, of their entire network. Um, uh, this is based, uh, this is really high fidelity. It's, it's physics based. Um, it's a vector model, um, and we provide real-world information on pole height, pole lean, conductor length, attachment points, etc., across all voltage levels. Um, we also do critical clearance and vegetation intrusion analytics, um, and also provide advanced services like uh, tree species identification, growth modeling, you know, health indices, and uh, we can also create a dynamic model for you know scenario analysis uh, in case of you know event or, or uh, and so on. Um, as you can imagine, this technology it, it can can be uh, can also be used in various other sectors. For instance, forestry, when it comes to uh, uh, me measuring these kind of analytics of vegetation, we also provide uh, services to various uh, DOTs. Um, we uh, we provide both data acquisition and uh, analysis solutions. Uh, we provide them to road authorities and airports all over the world, actually. Um, we capture millions of geospatially referenced measurements on every mile that we drive. Um, and we build a digital twin of the current state of our client's road network. So by combining multiple annual survey results, um, traffic data, construction his history, et cetera, asset managers and engineers can really make data-driven driven decisions to optimize their available funding, uh, but also achieve uh, their asset management targets. So essentially, we help agencies apply the right treatment to the right road at the right time to optimize the life of, uh, of their assets with the available funding. Um, we do a similar kind of uh, service to railway networks, uh, also all over the world. Um, just like in the previous example with the roads, we also have a sensor that very quickly and very accurately acquires uh, uh, information around uh, the, the corridor of railway network at line speed, which means you don't have to, you know, close off uh, a portion of the rail when you're doing, uh, you know, maintenance activities and so on. Well, you still have to do the maintenance activities, but the, the, the surveying the need to do maintenance activities. Um, can be done very, very quickly um, and non-intrusively using uh, using this technology. So essentially, we built a digital twin of the of the railway corridor. Um, and not just that, we 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 provide smart tamping uh, support to smart tamping. We provide again the vegetation analytics that I talked about earlier for uh, the railway uh, sector, um, but also do foundational and other uh, like groundwater and these kind of really uh, really deep uh, geotechnical uh, an, uh, analysis as well. Given you a lot of examples now about what we do on land, it's uh, what we do is not limited to land. Uh, we also do a lot of work on the coastal zone. Clearly, this is um, an area of, of imminent danger uh, when it comes to you know sea level rise and and, and the effects of climate change. Um, so we we essentially use every tool in our toolbox to be able to build digital twins to really support coastal resilience, whether it is um, robots under sea, whether it's big survey vessels, whether it's uncrewed autonomous uh, surface vessels, or whether it's satellite data um, and, 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 and airborne LIDAR. Um, all of that comes together in mapping the coastal zone to really, um, you know, measure that interplay between the land and the sea, which is not a trivial uh, task. Uh, but because we have a unique uh, combination of both marine and land expertise, we're able to really put it together, um, um, you know, for this use case. Uh, what we we then add, tend to do is have a con consultancy led approach. Uh, we 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 really try to understand the the, the precise question that our clients uh, want want answered, and really choose the best tools from the toolbox to really uh, build the right solution for them. Um, Again, this shows you a little bit about, you know, um, the, the, the technologies we have available uh, in-house, specifically around hydrography uh, for uh, for more the marine and the, 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 the you know, uh, the, the underwater applications. I'll close off by giving you a bit of an example of how we're moving towards the metaverse. Um, geodata is only useful if it can be understood, it can be used by, by a variety of different stakeholders. And that means the, the, the data have to be presented in, in an immersive way, in a, in a way that, that, that can be actionable. So um, this is an example of the island of St. Martin in the Caribbean. Um, this island was utterly devastated after Hurricane Irma in, uh, in 2017. So um, we were commissioned to do a, 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 a LIDAR survey of the island, both on land and the, the shallow uh, water, the bathymetry, so airborne LIDAR bathymetry. Um, and by by providing the insights um, uh, in, a, in an immersive environment like this, you can really start modeling and doing scenario analysis of what would really be the effect of, of a certain event or, uh, or you know, in this case, a sea level rise event over infrastructure uh, on, on the island. 
Um, so uh, you can you can start building models and doing doing risk analysis. Uh, but also uh, turning on and off different layers, uh, depending on whether you want the models to be shown, or whether you want point cloud, what sort of accuracy do you want to really be communicating uh, to your clients. All of that in a very snappy, very quick uh, web interface, which means it's very accessible to a variety of different stakeholders and decision makers who need, uh, you know, who need uh, uh, this sort of data. So uh, what's of course very, very important, uh, it all looks very pretty on a screen, but you uh, on the back end, you need to take care of a variety of different uh, factors. Uh, you need to be very open and upfront about the accuracy of the data you're presenting. I think that is key. Um, you need to have intro, uh, you know, you need to follow the fair data principles. I think that is also a, a very, a, a very key uh, point when you're talking about digital twins. Um, uh, having a cloud-based service, making it accessible, um, and really paying attention to security because information is great, but information in the wrong hands is maybe not so great. So um, with that, I'd, I'd like to close off. Um, uh, you have my contact details on screen now. Um, so if you have uh, even beyond the Q&A session, if you have any anything you'd like to uh, you know bounce off, I'd be very happy to hear from you. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. And with that, I'll pass on to uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, who will be Dr. Simon Museus from uh, Hexagon. Thank you, Pooja. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. My name is Sam Mazeus, and um, I'm Vice President of Business Development at Hexagon in the Division of Special Content Solutions, or better known as the Airborne Division. And um, I have given the uh, title today to uh, the presentation, The Metaverse is Not the Territory. Well, you might have all heard a little bit uh, about this phrase, this famous phrase, the map is not the territory by uh, Arbit Korsipski, and I hope I have spelled that well. And uh, he was a Polish-American philosopher and engineer, he used to convey the fact that people often confuse models with reality, uh, reality with reality itself. Now, our forefathers were confined to hardware carrying geo-information. This gentleman said that in the 1930s. But uh, also today, while we are modeling and capturing data, we will always remain a little bit behind reality. But with the metaverse, we are creating something never seen before. We create a common synchronous view on reality with its history and possible futures. So the metaverse is much more than the territory. If you were to measure success by the amount of data we've been able to create, we achieved nirvana already. We're creating a lot of data that goes unused, as illustrated in the graph on the left. The data leverage gap is exponentially increasing. The reality is data is only as good as the systems we use to leverage and mine for insights. And that's where autonomy comes in. And uh, we are focusing a hexagon on autonomy. And uh, as a system becomes more automated, it becomes more autonomous, where AI and machine learning put data to work behind the scenes, freeing us from the constraints of data overload and enabling the freedom of insight. Not possible before. At Hexagon, we call this smart digital reality. Now, I will still present Hexagon very, very shortly in case you have not heard all of this from us. And so this is Hexagon in brief. When it comes to innovation, Hexagon has set the bar pretty high and we should be continues to innovate at scale, investing about 10 to 12% of the revenues only for R&D. Our relevancy is vital. Customers find us and remain with us because we are strategically critical to sort of success. And stability speaks for itself. We have 24,000 employees today in more than 50 countries while we're still focusing very, very much and more and more on sustainability. It's an integral part of the strategy. And uh, also please look at our activities in our company, Our Evolution, where we are focusing on driving profitable business value that ensures economic growth, but not at the expense of the planet or the people, all the contrary. And these are the industries where we contribute. You can see now why one out of eight persons in this world is daily somehow in connection with somehow with hexagon technology. Now, let me come to the metaverse. It's difficult to have a complete definition of the metaverse as with any new technology and concept it extends. It is a little bit like trying to draw some body in the fourth dimension. Uh, it will always remain difficult, remain 
incomplete and at the end of the day you only end up by drawing a shade of it. Digital twins are real-time simulations of physical entities for monitoring, analysis and control. We are very well aware of that. Now, when we look into the metaverse, we will step up. It refers, from our point of view, my point of view, to a collective virtual shared space that is created by converging physical and virtual reality. It's the environment in which the digital world makes sense to the user. In very broad terms, the metaverse connects digital twins and allows interaction with them through and between a multitude of interfaces and platforms, often created and maintained by different entities. So nobody can claim the metaverse is his or hers or theirs. The interaction here is more social and experiential with users human and non-human navigating, interacting within this environment. Now, when I go to Hexagon, we call the level of interaction here the smart digital reality. It requires a feedback loop where we come in with five different areas of technology. Reality capture, where we collect the data with all measurement technology we give to the market and use ourselves. Positioning technology, design and simulation softwares and systems, location intelligence, and at the end of the day, also autonomous technologies. Altogether, we merge these two into what we call the smart digital reality. Sensors in the real world connecting to the digital twin and further to the metaverse on the right hand side in the digital world. And this helps us also later to work on an actionable feedback loop. On one hand, we connect the geodata, we collect the geodata, we analyze it, create actions in different areas, divulge them, uh, scrutinize them, act on them in the real world and bring it back. You see, I like this bar here in the lower part, it tells us what the history is, what is today, what could be in the simulation, what should be in an instructive environment and what will be because we decided ourselves. When we go to the geospatial technology, we are consequently, um, uh, consequently subject to limitations. We can see from our customers that we're seeing demands in capturing larger areas of increasingly higher resolution imagery. We want to go closer to real time, uh, higher LIDAR point densities. We've been measuring large swaths of area in Europe, better to say in Germany, with 42 points per square meter already. And we're talking here about more than 3,000 square miles. Um, with higher uh, refresh frequencies, all for a lower price and reduced environmental impact. From a sensor development, acquisition, and data delivery perspective, the industry is being forced to seek increased productivity and deliver creative business models that benefit our customers. How do we respond to this? We build and integrate sensors, specifically hybrid sensors, and coherent and interconnected seamless workflows, which allow us to see tremendous gains in productivity. By maintaining, second, and expanding high-resolution 2D and 3D content programs in terms of geographical extension, physical and temporal resolution, data types, and last but not least, affordability and convenience for the user. Because what is it worth if no one can pay it, and if it were more expensive than what we have already? At the core of this are our hybrid airborne technologies. And uh, here we are producing in one single go, one single flight over, especially all of these data sets. We have core data sets that are generated right away um, without major modeling. And we're talking about the standards like the DSM, the DEM, we have point clouds, we have standard order photos, opening imagery, specifically then they will like, like a city mapper. And with both technologies, so cameras, oblique cameras, uh, so four band cameras, plus fully um, developed laser scanners, so two basically class one systems in one, which is unique for Leica. We can later create in maybe not in real time, but pretty close to it, mesh models 
true auto photos, land cover maps, building models, and three models. So just imagine that low environmental impact, a single system in a single hatch in an aircraft, and you create basically the entire representation of your visible reality. This is the uh, technology, and by the way, you can give a very good look uh, on these in the next two weeks at the Intergeo in Berlin. Uh, we present all of this technology plus the data. Um, our content programs, you might have also been in contact with them already. We have countrywide programs. It means we are filling um, our so the databases uh, for licensing access, so for, free, uh, for complete access to cities with very high uh, resolution down to uh, one inch resolution imagery and more than 20 points per square meter lighter density at the same time in 3D models up to countrywide programs. Just for example, the United States, we are covering at the moment the third or in some areas the fourth time already with resolutions up to six inches autophoto in various states and uh, including uh, concomitantly flown LiDAR. All this data at the uh, tip of your fingers, if you click in our Hexagon Content Program Access. Now let's go a step further in uh, Europe and also in the United States. We have created, in combination with cyclomedia data, means mobile mapping data on the ground, something that's called the super mesh. We are here modeling from the air and from the ground a consistent and combined mesh, which is not only 2.5D like often uh, aerial survey meshes are. It is a full 3D mesh. That means we are generating here a full view on the reality from the ground and uh, from the air, which can be merged um, in all its details, under trees, under canopies, also into a virtual reality and serves as the single source of truth for city planners, urban planners, architects, um, autonomous driving companies, and uh, of course, everybody who uses this featureized and classified data. Once this data here is available, then it might not be the complete set. So we have not only these sensors, we also have drones, we have uh, terrestrial laser scanners, we have any other type of sensors, even real-time sensors installed in the cities. We combine this data with existing hexagon content, we combine it with commercial and publicly available data services, and using it all from cloud platform and our uh, artificial intelligence, we create the digital twins in a combination with uh, meshes, semantic indexes, and uh, customer data, maybe and um, generate here twins or uh, even better solutions in the metaverse for different industries. Now, uh, here you see that we are uh, very focused on the United States. And the, uh, everybody knows New York. And uh, this is a beautiful data set, which we did with our hybrid systems uh, over New York. You can see here a uh, very nice modeling of the uh, vegetation. This is not, not only important for the gardeners and uh, for the services, for the local services, but also for environmental um, uh, simulations and, uh, well, generally for the uh, administration of the city. Now, our solutions are focusing on two ecosystems. One are the production ecosystems where we are uh, implementing directly to improve the productivity, but also on the people where we work in the complete life cycle to make sure that the uh, life quality increases. The Metaverse doesn't stop here, so this is not only the geographical information, we go even further and we introduce the industrial metaverse. And have a look here. Um, we have focused uh, a, more and more, we are focusing more and more in Hexagon on the integration across any type of scale. And as I said before, Metaverse is not only a single player game. Um, we are connecting here also with different partners in the industry. For instance, HXDR, Nexus, and NVIDIA Omniverse are all playing um, here in our 
combined environment with different platforms on the same metaverse. Just look here at this facilities where at the left hand side in HXCR, you see the reality capture data. In Nexus, you see the technical drawings. And um, in uh, NVIDIA Omniverse, we see and have the ability of changing the environment in a simulation and design uh, manner. And all is referring to the same reality. So thank you very much. And um, I'm looking forward to be more in interaction with you. We are excited about the metaverse. And uh, if you want to be in contact with me, then just use simon.museos at hexagon.com or look at our homepage. Thank you very much. And with this, I hand over to Greg Damchuk, um, R&D Senior Director at Bentley. Cool, thank you, Simon. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the infrastructure metaverse. Is this fact or uh, vision? And you know, what what could these virtual environments do? Could they improve or not improve um, um, our our life? So, just as an entry point here, at Bentley Systems. I work with, with Bentley Systems. I run our innovation lab. If you're not familiar with um, with our solution, we we have really pivoted towards uh, digital twins as a, as a core business offering. And we serve the engineering, uh, like basically industry professionals who are in charge of designing, building and operating the world's infrastructure. So how do you manage, construct, design, operate um, assets uh, for, for core infrastructure? And our big shift has been from uh, really to go from just desktop computing into what we call the iTwin platform, which is a cloud-based platform that can um, they can serve up and collect and federate all the different uh, content that flow throughout an engineering process from the point clouds to the photogrammetry into, into BIM models. And so our core shift here has been to build a platform, this iTwin platform, a digital twin platform that's, that's running cloud native. All the data runs in the cloud. And we believe that this philosophy, this, this core set of pieces, a, a, a digital twin platform with cloud access is actually what leads to innovation. And, and I'll show you how we think that leads into the metaverse. Um, I think we've covered what a digital twin means. I don't need, I won't repeat the definition, uh, but just, uh, just to cover this point, the Bentley iTwin platform can federate and store and make available all this common forms of information from a geospatial perspective. And that is produced with Bentley products in some cases, like our iTwin Capture solution. But it, we can also federate uh, information from any external source and bring that into this cloud-powered iTwin platform. So then knowing that we've got this platform and we can federate all this information in cloud environment, uh, you know, what, what have I been really focusing on? And it's really designing and looking at 3D experiences for infrastructure professionals with the emerging technologies. And I'm calling this metaverse-like stuff. So what does the metaverse look like for infrastructure professionals? And that's really the focus here uh, for my team in the lab is trying to understand the value and explore the value of 3D interactive media and use cases that support design, construction, and operations of the built environment. Practically speaking, it's a very much hands-on work with uh, myself and my team. We, uh, we visit construction sites, we visit facilities, we get access to huge complex data sets from all the different formats, point clouds, photogrammetry, um, BIM models. And we've been working on a, a pipeline here to, to bring uh, these complex engineering models into our platform and then egress out through API calls into interactive game experiences, in this case, using Unreal Game Engine. Uh, we love to go out there and present this work and actually bring the content uh, into, into the field and let people experience these models uh, you know, firsthand. Uh, one thing I'll mention too, when we talk about the metaverse and interactive experiences, and sometimes it's perfect for VR, but it's, it's not like a prerequisite. <clears throat> so we also develop uh, interactive uh, displays that work with large projection systems, desktop computing, VR, and also uh, augmented reality in the form of something like uh, the Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, but yeah, we like to get hands-on and inside VR experiences. We're also exploring virtual production environments as a way to interact with this content and even 
you can see me there with a, a haptic bodysuit on uh, to start to feel things. So when it comes to, to the metaverse, uh, basically we explore use cases, we develop user experience, we combine that with emerging tech, and we're really trying to see uh, what emerges through this through this experience. So I think uh, just to dial back a minute to think about the metaverse word itself, uh, in some ways we we sort of got stuck with this term uh, the metaverse because of um, Facebook's changing its name. But if you go back in time, in fact, we, we could be calling this thing the sensorama. This goes back to the 1960s, uh, early experiments in immersive multimodal experience of content. You can see here, it was 3D, wide vision, stereo sound. They even introduced smell into the experience. So it was a full sensory experience of 3D content. So just what I want to mention that, that the idea of the metaverse and immersive interactive experiences actually goes way back as early as the 1960s. It's, it's not something that just emerged um, as a result of, of Facebook changing its name to Meta. And of course, if you know William Gibson and Neil Stevenson, two great authors in this space, Gibson wrote about the matrix and cyberspace uh, with Neuromancer in the 1980s. We could be calling this the cyberspace or the matrix. You know, back in the 80s, he imagined you're actually um, networked in with a trode network and interacting with cyberspace uh, with your keyboard and direct uh, content going straight to the mind. Of course, Stevenson wrote Snow Crash, more of a dystopian view, and that was uh, what Mark Zuckerberg kind of picked up on uh, with his version of the metaverse, very much Snow Crash oriented. And of course, they changed the name. There's a huge spike. Um, but then just to set this in terms of like uh, of hype cycle here, this is meta changing its name, the metaverse, a little bit of a bump there. But I'm just comparing this against chat GPT, just, just in terms of relative impact here. The metaverse, in fact, is, is, is a small blip when you think about it compared to something like chat GPT. Um, so more or less, the way we've been approaching this is the metaverse. It's, it's nothing to get too maybe worried about. We keep moving on. And I think what's interesting, what the metaverse did bring to the table was a conversation about uh, like definition and requirements. And I really like Matthew Ball's definition, although you can also search chat GPT and see what they have to say. Uh, but if you kind of break down his definition that he wrote in this book, the metaverse, you sort of get to some bullet points here, which is an interoperable and network system of real-time rendered 3D virtual environments with an unlimited number of users who can have a sense of presence and a continuity of data throughout that experience. Now we think about the infrastructure metaverse, we just start to introduce this as like engineering grade environments. So these are engineering grade uh, CAD models, BIM models, uh, point clouds, laser scanning. And the continuity of data now involves like revisions, change sets, views, objects, issues that build up over time against that physical real asset. It's a very different approach to what uh, Mark Zuckerberg imagined. So practically speaking, this is what something like this looks like. This is an example of our Unreal Engine pipeline that takes uh, full resolution engineering CATIA models into the iTwin platform and then streams that into Unreal Game Engine. And then we stream that experience into a web browser where we can have multiple players experience that content in real time. And the, the idea here is that the meeting, the actual experience of an engineering grade content can happen by combining all these different pieces web graphics, game engines, new pipelines to federate uh, 3D models and get high performance experiences uh, with this content. So in fact, all of this is actually possible today. It's more uh, fact than fiction, I would say. Here's another example of a third party partner we're working with here in the UK called Unit 9. They're also using our pipeline from the iTwin platform to pipe in uh, construction data, construction 4D models into an Unreal Engine application that's also linking in with live web cameras and multiplayer experience. And they've also linked in real-time uh, uh, sensors to pull in CCTV camera feeds from the construction site. So again, this is some examples of multiplayer unlimited scale models um, operating with, uh, with real content of like unlimited scale and a persistent access to data such as real-time CCTV camera feeds. Of course, this works in uh, buildings like this, architecture examples. You can pipe in geometry into a VR experience now with, with a few clicks. Um, 
And of course, that can be experienced by multiple players at the same time. Uh, we've also experimented with pulling these models into a shared mixed reality experience. In this case, a construction uh, simulation model at table scale being experienced by two, three, four people at the same time with a holographic uh, display system. So again, I mentioned these examples to bring in the idea that this geospatial data, uh, it can now in fact be experienced by more than one player at the same time. And that in many ways is leveraging the power of game engine technology that's been developed over the last 20 plus years. In terms of this pipeline we've developed, I call the infrastructure architecture. It's really just a pipeline that we've developed that goes 3D files. Okay, again, that includes meshes and point clouds through our iTwin platform. Uh, and then via APIs, we can access uh, this geometry through Unreal Engine and then produce a whole range of uh, user experience and applications uh, on top of that pipeline. And so you might ask, like, what's the point of all that? And so really, for me, the idea here, and this is going back to, you know, Marshall McLuhan quote, uh, is that the medium is the message. We're actually introducing a new medium for communication, right? Uh, an interactive 3D medium that can be experienced by multiple people at the same time in order to produce these feedback loops. And I think that's sort of the power of this, of this medium. I'll skip past this um, in the nature of time. Just our, our core development environment is actually Unreal Engine, but connected uh, to our iTwin platform. And this is just some examples of what this looks like that we've been developing from a, from a metaverse perspective. The ability to kind of move through uh, a lobby, a sequence like this, have a, have a game-like experience, but then be able to teleport into an actual uh, uh, you know, industrial-grade asset um, all from the context of a single uh, game experience. And again, enabling multiplayer interaction with it, with these models. So the point is you're going from kind of a game-like environment, like the like idea of a lobby or like a web page, um, into an unlimited number of 3D uh, environments that you can navigate through uh, with something like an Xbox controller. We've also developed experiences like this uh, in terms of uh, like training and simulation. So uh, when you can uh, actually practice flying the drone, like we're, we've talked a lot about the use of drones and aerial photography to capture the mesh, you can actually do your training inside a virtual environment and practice flying the drone uh, yourself, or you can even run autonomous flight simulations to train the drone before you actually go out and do the uh, photogrammetry capture. So that's interesting when the metaverse actually becomes an environment in order to train pilots and AI systems in order to capture reality. And I think I'm just going to very quickly jump into this uh, real-time uh, demonstration here, just to show you an example. Uh, so I'm actually playing the game right now. This is an example of a bridge in uh, in uh, Minneapolis. And what we've done here is geolocated two different types of captures inside of our uh, inside of Unreal Engine. Uh, on the right hand side is coming from our iTwin capture platform. This was captured with a uh, with a drone and processed into photogrammetry. And you just can see kind of the incredible resolution and quality we can get. Uh, with with a well managed uh, drone capture of this asset. Of course, this is used to then do an inspection off the drone capture from anywhere, like me right here sitting in London, flying through this model with an Xbox controller. And just to give this more geo context, we've got this model linked up here with the latest Google three D Tiles plugin, also operating inside of Unreal Engine. So the point I want to make here is that depending on the resolution and the quality. Uh, you can actually start to merge multiple and unlimited streams of data, everything from a kind of low quality mesh here uh, from, from Google uh, to the actual final resolution capture from the, uh, from the drone capture. And of course, this can be continuously updated and, and modified as, as more and more captures take place. So I just want to show that uh, just a recent example of that. And sort of where we're thinking about taking this is that through the use of AI and computer vision and uh, basically uh, training, we can actually detect things like cracks, uh, rust damage and spalding in the concrete and then direct users' attention 
um, straight to these situations and then and then go do that virtual inspection. So we're actively looking at how to use uh, trained images to then surface you know, where people should uh, pay attention to these meshes that have been captured. Uh, cool. And I know that we're um, we're short on time. So I just one last picture here, just on the metaverse uh, concept. The thing we're exploring here from the metaverse is, you know, not having to always be completely immersed in a, in a VR situation. What does it mean to actually start to leverage these pass through rendering techniques? So here you can see your physical environment, but you can also interact with digital content and you can teleport into a complete immersive, uh, you know, situation. So I think something to watch out for um, is this kind of blending of both mixed and virtual reality. Of course, that's with the Meta um, Pro. And of course, with the Apple Vision Pro coming out, uh, they've adopted a similar strategy for uh, for mixed uh, mixed reality. Um, so, in summary, I think you know what we've discovered, and hopefully this this shows that actually the infrastructure metaverse can be is practically cool. It's practical. It's got cool. It sort of brings the ability to have a, an interaction with uh, with these engineering uh, assets that is practical, but also sticky. You know, it's got a cool factor for sure. Um, so with that, um, I will hand it over to uh, Peter Atala from uh, the CEO of Voxel Maps. And then, uh, then if, um, if you do need to reach out to me, uh, definitely hit me up on LinkedIn or drop me a, a note at any point. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, Peter, it's all yours. Thank you, Greg. Uh, appreciate that. So let me just share my screen, everyone. Um, one moment. So hopefully you can all see that. So really really interesting talks from everybody and, and greg i love some of those examples that's some really really cool stuff that i've seen actually being used for for the metaverse um so my name is peter Atala. i'm the ceo and founder of a company called voxel maps and at voxel we build maps for machines and a big part of that is actually digital twins and utilizing digital twins at scale my talk today is going to be a little bit different in fact i want to be a little bit of a contrarian and talk about the practicalities of the metaverse as it exists today um, and digital twins and how that relates really to, to kind of GIS as well. So I think the starting point is to, to start to define what we mean by the metaverse. So my talk is going to focus on the metaverse as most people probably imagine it. And so this is an immersive 3D world that we access using some kind of virtual reality headset or maybe an augmented reality headset. So the comments I make is going to be based on that concept of the metaverse. Well, Let's get started then. So the metaverse, the first thing to appreciate for the current metaverse that exists is it's a young world. In, in fact, mainly children use it. So over 83% of the users are under the age of 18 and 51% are under the age of 13. So you can imagine the majority of what they're using that for is gaming and virtual worlds. And so that's where you're getting the engagement. They're interacting with the, the game, which is which is cool for them. Actually, adults have very limited engagement with the metaverse, and that's probably true for the majority of you as well. You know, think back in the past year, how much time, you know, how many times have you been in the metaverse? How much time did you spend in there as well? So if adult presence is relatively sparse, professional presence is even more sparse. And so one of the things you've got to consider in, in deciding to do something with the metaverse is who is your audience and where is your audience? You know, are you building a technology to actually have engagement? Uh, are you going to encourage them to come and use it? So you're going to encourage the adoption of the metaverse or is your audience somewhere else? Now, let's move on to metaverse abstractions. The, this is both a cool thing and also one of the problems as well. So we saw in Greg's presentation some really cool interfaces and ideas about how you can collaborate in, in the metaverse. And there are some really, really cool examples of that. So one example here is an architecture app, and you can see it's collaborative. So we have people that are meeting in the virtual space. They're able to look at buildings, pick buildings up, change the size of buildings, and have a look at them. However, generally speaking, the level of abstraction makes them not look real, sometimes uncanny, in, in fact. And so these non-realistic depictions of data can start to water down the fidelity of some of the GIS data that you might be uh, used to using as well. The other big issue is the navigational challenges. 
And I, you know, it's really interesting some of the pictures, and I'm sure all of you have used the headsets, but when you're trying to navigate the 3D environment, it's not easy. Unless you're an expert gamer, um, which is your hobby and your pastime, it's kind of clunky. It's It feels certainly very alien. And one of the big problems with that is that information access, so how you retrieve information, and also how you communicate slows down. Well, if it slows down, that means we've got a productivity issue as well. So there's major productivity concerns with using the metaverse. Now, don't get me wrong, for visualization, they can still be cool. But if you actually want to do work in the metaverse, it becomes a little bit harder. And another issue which compounds that is the lack of integration into work tools or into workflow. Uh, so for example, you're in the metaverse, you have your headset on, you're looking at things, and you need to take the information out of the metaverse into something more standard. Maybe it's a GIS application, maybe it's an asset management, maybe it's an Excel spreadsheet. How do you physically do that? It's really hard. You take the helmet off and write something down. Do you, how, you, know, do you use a 3D virtual interface? It slows down. So for some applications, traditional interfaces into data actually are more productive as well. So we've got the promise of what we imagine the metaverse can be in the future, but we have some key dependencies, which are kind of, we have to wait to basically get there. And the first one is this evolution of hardware. So you've seen that this is an example of many different types of hardware and hardware is obviously always iterating and always coming along, but it's still pretty clunky. It's still pretty alien for us. It's not comfortable for us to wear all the time and it's not seamless. Now we have some great things coming out from, from Apple. They look much better probably than a lot of the other devices that exist at the moment, but it's still relatively early days. And while it's early days in the hardware, it's also early days for the platform. So we have a platform dilemma. Which platform should we be building to and deploying on? And the thing is, there's not going to be one metaverse. You know, there's going to be many different metaverses. And so there's a concept then of how do you link these together? How do you not build, you know, recreate everything that you're doing in every different metaverse, but how do you join them together? That concept of interconnecting doesn't exist very well. There are some strides towards this, certainly NVIDIA with the, the Omniverse is trying to do that, but there's no clear winner here as well. And that makes it a little bit more difficult to get behind from a corporate level to, to start investing and start building in the metaverse. So what can you do? What are the practicalities of the current metaverse? Well, one of the silver linings, as I've mentioned, is to be able to do visualization. So there's definitely something to be said by being able to stand inside your data being able to see the 3D scenes around you on a one-to-one -one scale, be able to walk or move down the streets and actually see those things. That's definitely very interesting. Again, we hit the efficiency problem though. So in this scene, for example, if we're just trying to look at streetlights, you know, we want to measure a streetlight. Well, we can kind of do that with our 3D controllers, but probably it'd be easier on a computer in 2D to do this or, or 3D be using a 2D interface. And if we want to do that for the whole street, that becomes a you know, cumbersome task. Now, I think there's there's some great convergent technology here, which might solve a lot of this. So I definitely see a lot of application in combining the metaverse with large language models like ChatGTP. So you can imagine in the future, you can be in the environment with almost an AI assistant, and you can ask it to do the work that you want. You can notice a feature and ask it to, to measure it and to extract it to write it to a GeoJSON file or an Excel spreadsheet or something else. And I think that holds great promise. And there's a number of papers that have been written on people starting to explore that. So that's definitely an exciting area. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk now about digital twins. And I think really digital twins are kind of coming through that, that hype cycle. I know we we talked about that on the, the last event. And I think we're just turning that, that curve and starting to grow again as well. But digital twins are really focused much more on trying to solve specific problems. So irrespective of whether you're talking about 2D digital twins or 3D or even real-time digital twins, there's immediate application that, that, uh, that can be utilized. And in addition to that, you can have a hybrid where you're taking the digital twin out into the real world. So definitely, and we've seen some examples of that today using augmented reality and, and projecting that over reality as well. That has some immediate uh, applications, definitely. And I think digital twins really becomes that bridge between the two. You know, you can start working well in digital twins. And if you build them in the right way, then you can kind of future proof that 
technology to be able to take it with you on that journey into the metaverse as well. So to do that, it's important to prioritize standards, whether you're building it yourself or you're licensing tools and technologies, supporting standards like USD or GLTF will, will make it easier. And I suggest for anybody that's interested, have a look at the metaverse standards forum or the OGC. Um, these standards become very useful when you're starting to make decisions. But what about the metaverse, it, it, the digital twins into the metaverse? Well, I still think personally that this is still quite a long road ahead. I think we've got to eagerly await the new products and we've got to define a category still. When I say we, it's really going to be the bigger companies that are giving us this seamless access uh, to it. And once you start to, to see that, then I think you can start to see and expect many more digital twins that are integrating into the metaverse platforms. So let's do a reality check. Is them, you know, in terms of the perception of the metaverse, is this a genuine revolution or is this a, the corporate emperor's new clothes? And my opinion is that it's both. I think there is a genuine revolution. I firmly believe the metaverse will happen and it will be kind of what we dream and imagine it to be. But at the moment, it really is a bit of the emperor's new clothes. Now, if you're doing this just from an innovation point of view and to do cool things, you can definitely do cool things there. If you're really trying to solve problems and get people to adopt it, you've got a long journey to go if you're really trying to do that in an immersive space. And I think what we have to wait and see is the battles that are coming in terms of the headsets and the access points. Which companies are going to win those battles for, for people's eyes? And that's why I think it's totally acceptable to do strategic waiting, right? It's a really promising technology, but it's not quite ready yet monitor the markets, understand the trends, who's going to emerge as a leader, but not just who's emerging as a leader, who are the users? What are the usage trends? How much time are people now devoting and spending in this immersive reality as well? So that allows you to have a balanced strategy, prioritize the user needs, the practicalities of what you want, the usability of what you want, and be ready. You know, I think you can definitely do all the things you need to in the digital twins, and you need to be ready for when the metaverse really takes off, because when it does, it, the, the progress will be rapid. That That is clear. Um, but I think we've got a number of years to come before we're really going to see a, you know, a mass adoption for the geospatial industry anyway. So I just want to finalize just very quickly on what we do as well. So a big focus of what we do is collecting data and building out real-time 4D digital twins. So we already do this at scale. Uh, for example, this year, We've collected over 2 million kilometers of data for our customers across 26 different countries. And the digital twins we build are real time and they're multimodal. And we've, again, we've seen some examples of that as well. We take data, very high resolution data. So we're talking very dense point clouds and imagery. Um, and we take that from the street level, from aerial, and we do it for indoor data sets as well, or where we can't get vehicles or we can't see it from, from the sky. And those merge together to create this, this digital twin. And we then combine it with mobile mapping sensors, which are real time. These are 5G enabled sensors, and they actually stream data in real time to the model. And then the model automatically updates itself and automatically indexes, uses quite advanced artificial intelligence to recognize those features and tell you really what's going on with your digital twin. And that concept of having a fourth dimension of time allows you to do change detection, allows you to really look in detail, not just at what is there, but what is changing and what do those changes mean. And so for many different applications, that becomes very, very powerful. And finally, we're optimistic. As much as maybe I've been critical of the current state of the, the metaverse, it will happen. You know, it's an, I think it's an inevitability. The question is when. So we're very much, you know, awaiting that. We've done some POCs in there as well. But I think we're really looking for which hardware, which platforms, which control interfaces allow us to have high bandwidth between us as a user and the metaverse environment and to understand when we can start to see the trends of genuine adoption. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I know we're going to have a panel discussion now. So guys, why don't you... Join me now, and I think, Bob, over to you for, for conducting the panel. Great. Thank you so much, um, Peter, and I appreciate those uh, comments. Yeah, if everyone can put their screens on, and just for folks that are still hanging with us, and thank you very much for that. We've had great participation. We're just going to put one more poll out uh, that will have, I think, three or four questions. So if you could just take 
uh, a minute to fill that out because it'll give us a little bit uh, of additional information <clears throat> about uh, what you've heard today. So take a minute or two to do that. Um, while you're doing that, um, I guess I just want to say a couple things and then we'll uh, we'll t take a look at those poll results and then we'll um, uh, and then we'll turn it over. Um, first of all, um, Victor, thanks so much uh, for joining because I do think at some point we may want to come back to just, you know, some of the challenges that maybe you've had getting other departments on the government side to work together. And so is the data resident with each of those departments or does it come into uh, your platform? And so I'm kind of curious, um, curious about that. So maybe you could think about how to respond to that. Um, Pooja, thanks so much. I really like the fact that you um, help bridge this modeling to just um, data visualization. I think that's a really important part. And I think actually each of the speakers after you uh, spoke about that. Simon, thanks for giving a shout out to InterGeo or InterGeo because WGIC and our members will be there in full force. So um, thank you for that. I uh, I also like the fact that um, you kind of laid some groundwork for, um, uh, well, one, no one can claim the metaverse as theirs. And I think, uh, and that is so important after we've heard these talks. Greg, um, thanks. You, you coming back to just the definition and the persistent access to data is so important. Um, and I think um, actually maybe all the speakers have made some reference to that. So thanks. And then actually, Greg, I kind of came away from your presentation feeling like I was, in fact, reading Snow Crash again, because you did, in fact, put kind of a being uh, in that uh, in environment. And then, Peter, it's always good hearing from you. Um, um, and it also also to put some uh, maybe cautionary tales back in uh, back on all of us, because um, while I don't personally only think of the metaverse as uh, a gaming or having a being kind of resident in that metaverse, I think of it as a forcing function for bringing the entire Earth system together. Um, I do think that was uh, really good that you put that cautionary tale there. Also, I wanted to say that when we WGIC put that first digital twin report out, you're right, and I'll do it, um, I guess I'll do it backwards for you guys. We did have kind of spatial digital twins up here and we weren't near that trough of disillusionment. But in listening to you, it almost sounds like for spatial digital twins, we're kind of coming through that trough and maybe are on our way back up. And then maybe the metaverse is still kind of, far, you know, a ways up here, before we get to that trough. So thanks for bringing that in. And then lastly, Peter, I do want to, you, you kind of brought things home to where Victor started when you made reference to bringing AI back into all of our analysis. So I thought that those were really nice kind of bookends on the whole presentation with Victor saying, we need to move in that direction. And then you coming back to that. So those are my comments just across the whole spectrum. Uh, let's see, can we look real quickly at those poll results? Um, let's see, so how do you see Spatial Digital Twins assisting you in your asset management programs? And actually the number one was uh, all of the above, which is provision of more timely and accurate uh, analytics and the ability to move from um, a cyclical to a risk or predictive based approach. So, th and, and the ability to conduct desktop uh, scoping and injection. So thanks you guys for answering that question. Um, I'm having uh, a little trouble uh, scrolling down. Uh, what sort of geodata are your spatial digital twins primarily based on? And it looks like it's a lot of drone data, uh, then airplane data, not so much satellite, 8%, mobile mapping, and then not so much uh, ocean 
data or survey vessels. Uh, and then lastly, what barriers are there for the adoption of spatial digital twins uh, culture and behavior? About 17% current business structure, which might actually be related to the culture and behavior, about 14%. The need for new policies and standards and the need for new working practices. Um, and then actually there might have been one other questions. Oh, how do you see digital twins developing uh, more and more uh, for asset management? Um, and that's about half the participants and the technology and potential are excellent, but needs more maturity before I can fully adopt it. Um, so that was about half and half. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that's all the questions. So thanks you guys for doing that. Um, let me just let me just open it up to panelists on anything that I've said. Victor, I don't know if you want to start out with just maybe some of the organizational challenges that you've had bringing all those applications and departments together, because that I think ties into one of the last questions about just the culture of our organization. So let me turn to you first, because we very much appreciate your perspective. Sure, Bob. Yeah. So um, from the uh, data sharing perspective, so if we look at digital twin, I think the main ingredient or the main content in it would be the 3D CT models. Uh, that is the main thing that, that binds everybody together. So you have that. Uh, someone have to capture it. Someone have to manage that, that data set over time. And of course, uh, I also show that uh, you need semantics for the city models. You need other data uh, to be overlaid into the 3D city models. So other data such as uh, your cadastra data, your uh, attributes of the building, the age of the building. So all these things, you need data sharing. You need your other agencies uh, who is uh, in, you know, who has a uh, regulatory power uh, to collect some data. And, and this needs uh, collaboration between the different uh, agencies. So in Singapore's context, uh, we have a platform. Uh, we can uh, quite easily um, uh, capture this information or integrate this information into the digital tweet, which is very important. Um, but having said that, having said that, I think there are still some challenges. Uh, there are some areas, uh, for example, uh, the land data and the sea data are not um, align in a way there are different data terms and these are very fundamental uh, challenges that we are looking at uh, from the perspective of integrating uh, the, 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 the different types of data, different group of data sets uh, to put them together to become a digital twin or digital twins that is useful and that is uh, 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 can meet the use cases. Pooja, I hear, I see you, I see you nodding on that land uh, water interface. You want to comment on that? And as you're thinking about that, um, there is a question from um, Cesar Arasso about uh, compatibility with some of the Esri suite of products. They're quite prevalent in some of the state and local governments. We've got a number of them on the phone. So if each of you, when you do take the floor, just comment if you do have any partnerships with Esri. Pooja, anything on land water interface to reinforce? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I completely understand uh, the, the angle you're coming from, Dr. Koo. Um, with, with, I think it's fair to, to say that oh, the, the data density over land is a lot more given that, you know, um, uh, yeah, the, the data penetration, reflectivity and all that, it's, it's just so much you know easier on land, if I may put it that way. And when you have accurate data set over land and maybe uh, slightly uh, higher error bars in, in your data sets over, over the ocean, connecting them and also with, with different datums and so on, that really becomes a challenge and it becomes a real geodetic problem uh, to solve. Um, yeah, so, so this is something we've, uh, through years of experience and, and expertise is something we've, uh, we've yeah, uh, we've uh, gotten quite good at. Um, and yeah, uh, I think you mentioned S3. We we obviously work very closely with S3, um, but we 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 work with actually a whole partner network.
network uh, really across the different domains we work on, because while we are very good at acquiring and, and processing your data, um, there will always be little gaps that are best filled by people who are best in those domains. Um, so the, the key is to find the best solution to a client's problem. And if that comes uh, partly from a partner, uh, yeah, we, we welcome uh, we welcome all the people listening in the call. Uh, we, we, we are very much into co-developing products uh, together with, with both clients and with partners. So yeah, we'd, we'd welcome that. Thanks, Pooja. Does anybody else want to jump in on either the data integration issue? Because uh, Pam Broviak did ask a question. And um, let's see, Greg, I do know she asked a specific question to you that you probably answered offline about some hydrologic data. She's come back in and said it certainly would be useful for modeling flooding as they're coming in. So anybody want to jump in on that? I'll just mention one thing just on that point. Uh, maybe I sort of covered it in my discussion. What I'm finding is important is to have like an open-ended uh, platform approach in general. Like I know we're all representing different software companies and and sort of solutions, but whether it's Esri or it's Cesium or it's the analysis of a, of a maybe a, bit, a very specific flood simulation software, or it could be point cloud, LIDAR, you know, scanning or photogrammetry. I think the key is to have an open ecosystem where any number of data sources can sort of come together for specific use cases to, to deliver, a, you know, specific value. Uh, my personal experience the last year and a half exploring really this metaverse space, you know, it's almost the metaverse brought forward this idea of like, um, you know, what do game engines bring to the to the table beyond just the multiplayer thing? What I've found is there's been great integrations, plugins, uh, and a really nice ecosystem out there uh, within the game engine community. You can make a connection to Esri. You can make a connection to Google. You can connect in with, um, with the iTwin platform. You can pull in BIM data from practically any source out there. And it becomes this great kind of like federator of experience. I think that's really quite interesting. So I just want to kind of mention that, Steve, like openness and interoperability, I think is is totally key and, and being willing to work with data from a wide range of uh, input sources, you know, types. Yeah, thank you for that, Greg. Simon, I would like to jump in there because I'm also connecting a little bit to Victor. Um, I, I love what Greg just said about the open ecosystem because uh, we see the metaverse in the future, um, we will see more and more non-human users. Of course, we have visual users, we have today visual interpretation, but uh, in the, the future is simply automated. Huh? So there might be today we are interacting with ChatGPT and uh, tomorrow ChatGPT will interact with another chat whatever. Huh? And they will not only support our decisions, they will take decisions. <laughs> as much as we give them the freedom, uh, given all the legal and access and privacy and whatever type of discussions we have are resolved by then. And uh, in so far, it's, it's very important with the open ecosystems, not only to, to have access rights, but also to have a common view on the reality um, in areas where we do not have the ability to prove necessarily what the reality is. Now, what Victor said, look, think about bathymetry. If you have a topographic scan or aerial photography, everybody can go out and check if it's right or not. If you, you cannot do the same with bathymetry. Bathymetric data is the reality. If you don't have a scan, if you don't have an, uh, an, a multi-beam measurement, you're blind. And probably too late, you find out. So in so far, it is so important to connect these for security and, well, simply for being able to trust in the users of the future metaverse <laughs> who are taking decisions on which we depend. I think this, uh, yeah, I think this, this is quite an, quite an important thing. We should all keep in mind that uh, automation is here around the corner and the metaverse connected boosts exponentially the ability of interconnect decision systems, not support systems, decision systems. Yeah, thank you. Peter, let's build on that a little bit because, um, you know, there's one uh, question left from uh, Evan Vernon. 
uh, how does the local, uh, the average local surveyor, one, get access to such data? That's number one. And it, it, but I think the thread running through this whole discussion is okay, we've got these digital twins all over the place. Uh, okay, we're arguing on WJC, we got to do a better job of workflow uh, integration, whether it comes from governments or cities or the commercial sector. Uh, standards are essential, no doubt about it, but we don't necessarily want to just think of it as a standards issue. It's really about a high level agreement that we want these spatial digital twins, wherever they are, to start to build out this metaverse. So talk about that a little bit and then give some advice to that surveyor, Evan, on the phone um, because if they don't even know where to start to find a digital twin or to find the data to construct their own digital twin, what advice do you have? And maybe so, let me just interrupt. And maybe that's why you got us up higher on the on the hype curve than uh, than in, through that trough. Okay. Well, well, building on a couple of threads there. So actually, Simon, what you were talking about uh, in terms of non-human actors within the metaverse and the application of AI and more advanced forms of AI. One of the, the things that's really interesting is, is to look at how the performance of large language models has been epic in comparison to any other forms of artificial intelligence before. Now, could the same kind of models be applied to spatial data? Theoretically, yes, but one of the big limiting factors is that all of the data is siloed at the moment. You know, It's owned by different organizations, different licensing rights, et cetera. And so actually being able to have a repository of almost all the world's geospatial data doesn't exist easily at the moment, right? And so I think that movement towards an open metaverse, you know, which can take some form of shape where more and more data becomes available, then you can start to apply much more advanced forms of AI. That a lot of the models that you know we've used that that you guys are using as well, these are you know older generation than transformer you know based models that we could be applying to data at scale, but we have to have enough of the, of that data. I think to Evan's point, it's it's a little bit more difficult. I think the industry still has to work a lot of that out. And I think one of the difficulties here is a lot of people have built business models around licensing and selling data. And so that's a commercial cost. And so how do we price that in a different way? Or how do we tease out that business model to, to be able to protect revenue so the companies can still exist and do the great things, but making that data more accessible to everybody? There are some aspects of open data, like, you know, 3DEP, et cetera, and different, you know, countries around the world have different programs as well. But personally, I'd like to see a lot more of that. And I know that's a big problem to try and solve, but I think it's one that we, as an industry, have to, and as a community, have to look at. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that in the sense that um, there's more to it than, of course, data availability. There's obviously a carbon footprint attached to acquiring data. Um, and the less of that we, we need to do, the, the more of it that we can share, uh, I think I think the better it is for us as a community, because duplication of data, uh, and I think, like I said at the beginning, we have just so much of data floating around, 80% just stays unused on a shelf, right? Um, if we're just able to reuse a lot more of that, uh, rather than acquiring and acquiring even more, uh, I think we'd be doing ourselves and the planet a lot of good. Great point. And, and to that point, actually, we had... A situation where for clients because of data ownership rights we had to collect pretty much the same data twice in the same year you know and it's kind of madness you know if that it data is. should just be available you know so yeah i agree yeah. with you yeah i think i'd like to jump in here i think there are three points that i think we all are discussing so um you know the 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 principle of collect once or capture once used by many is, is important i think in, in our case in singapore we started that very clearly that we want one agency uh, to do the work and all agencies are the users and that's the reason why we wanted to collect it at the highest resolution possible uh, of course with the cost that, that we can um, work on uh, and use by as many agencies as possible so, so that's one part of it and of course i think the other part of it is that when we started this whole work that we are doing uh, I think digitalization is 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 a key, you know, in in our city here, and we wanted to capture all this data in a digital form that is able to support non-human user. That's a starting point, and we know that when we move into a very high digitalization city, we need more digital data, and these are the digital data that can 
fit into the non-human user, like like the robots, the autonomous robots and autonomous vehicle. And with that, we 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 know that uh, you know the, the point clouds, the vector data. Uh, how do we handle that? We haven't got to that stage yet. The geo data is the starting point, but we are progressively going to creating new products out of the geo data that will fit into the robots. I think then the last point uh, is, is really about um, collecting all this data, capturing all this product at the end of the day for us is really is to be able to feed back to the industry. Uh, again, collect once used by many, industry will need this uh, data. Uh, we have a big job here uh, to look at what are the data that is useful that can be feedback to the users also is in the cycle it in the loop that the industry will benefit from the data that we have captured and created victor thank you so much for that um because actually i think that's maybe a nice way to come back to evan's question is um um evan first uh, go to your town, <laughs> see what government data is broadly and openly available. That's number one, whether it's state, local, or federal government. I'm assuming you're in the United States. Apologies if you are not. But I have to say, every single one of these uh, companies that you're looking at have big footprints here in the U.S. So feel free to reach out to any of them. If you can't find them, reach out to WGIC and we will put you in contact with them. So you guys, I think I know we're over, but it's been just phenomenal for me to hear this discussion. Thank you so much for your time, Victor. I know uh, you will be looking at uh, bed pretty soon. So thank you for staying up so late uh, for us. But uh, thank you, everyone, Peter, Simon, Pooja, Greg, this and Victor, of course, this is great. Um, again, thanks to Connect Me for hosting the event feel free to reach out to me personally or and or WGIC. Uh, we just very much appreciate um, pushing um, this issue forward and look in the next month or so for the release of our report on moving from spatial digital twins to the metaverse. It'll be um, available free of charge off our website. Thanks again, all our members. Really appreciate your support. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.